Indeed, here we are. We're oh, on like, bear. We got a tent in the background. Welcome, everybody, to Thursday Night Online Bible Study. What are we doing tonight? Uh, we're going to do chapter 25 of Exodus. Of the book of Exodus. Oh, there's my pen. I stuck it in here. Yeah. Then you forgot you did it. Then I forgot I did it. Because I never stick it there. I should How's everybody stick. doing? Give us a thumbs up in the comment section if you're doing a great, having a great day. And if you can hear us. <laughs> mom says hi. Hi, Mom. All right, we are going to uh, mm. pray that we're going to get started. And yeah, just, oh, Lord, help us. Because we've got... You're so funny. I have 39 verses to go. Lord Jesus, we do pray that you'd uh, just help us and uh, just have a great time, enjoyable time teaching the Word of God. And I pray, Father, that uh, that you would just encourage everybody and help them to love the book, because the book is amazing in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right, so um, let's think back to chapter 24 for a second. Book of the Covenant. Moses had been... Up on the mountain, yes. chapter 20, the end of chapter 20, then he went through chapter 21 and 22 and 23, and he had the whole book of the covenant. Yep. Comes down, gives the guys the verbal. Throws a lot of, oh, then he writes one. And then he writes it, which I really liked. And the then verbal agreement, and then with the written agreement, he splatters blood all over everybody. Everything. And, uh, and then the Lord calls him up into the mountain at the end of chapter 24, <laughs> where he's going to be in the mount for 40 days and 40 nights. And that leads us to chapter 25. And so these are the things that the Lord covers with Moses, and we're going to be on the mountain with him for a long time. I have a cup with green in it. You have a cup with green in it. Oh, yeah. that's fantastic. Yep. Yeah. All right. Um, so here's what we've got. Before we even start reading, I'm going to go over... <laughs> Stop it. I'm going to go over uh, what the next few chapters are going to be about. Oh, okay. And if you've if you've never seen the tabernacle, um, it's that tent thing right there. Tabernacle means tent. It's wait a minute. It's you've a got one too. It's a dwelling place, and so it's comprised of. Uh, back here in the back is the holy place of God, uh, and it's the holy of holies. Yes. And it has an ark in it, which is a golden box, and. Then there's a veil that separates and cuts this thing, not in half, but kind of back here. Yeah. And then there's a part that the priest could enter uh, in, in this area. And in here were a couple of pieces of furniture. There was a golden table where they put bread on it. There was a golden candlestick. And then there was an altar of incense. And out here you had a, uh, a wash basin, a very, very large wash basin called the laver. You can see how little the people are. It's a yeah. very big basin. Yep. And the reason they're washing up is because they've just done some sacrificing. They've walked up here. They've, you know, they're covered in ash and blood and everything. They wash up, and then they go in here and they they make offerings. This area out here is called the outer court, and there's a gate at the front facing east. And so they would walk in. They would do all their things. They would go in, and once a year, the high priest would go in from the holy place into the holy of holies. And he would make sacrifices unto God on behalf of this, the people. All right. So that's where we're at. General layout. Just a general layout. Mm -hmm. Chapter 25, where we're <laughs> at right now, God is going to start in the middle of the Holy of Holies. He's going to say, hey, take up an offering. Because what we're going to have to do is we're going to build an ark, which just means box. And it's going to have some staves, which are the sticks along the side of the box. And you'll see that. Uh, the mercy seat, which is the top lid of the box, and he's going to tell how to build the table of showbread and this candlestick. That's what we're going to cover today. Chapter 26, uh, we're going to look at the actual tent itself with its curtains and its boards, its bars, and the veil that's down the middle that separates the holy place from the holy of holies. After that, we go outside into the courtyard and we look at that altar where they're making the sacrifice. We talk about the court itself with all of its pillars and all of the, the curtains, the hangings. And we also talk about oil olive, which we call olive oil. And right. that's what the, uh, they would put in the candlestick so that it would be able to, to, to be lit at night. 
chapter 28, uh, we leave the tabernacle and we start building the priest's garments. There's the ephod, which we'll talk about, the ouches, which we'll talk about, the breastplate, the urim and the thummim, which we'll talk about, although nobody really knows what it is. And then in chapter 29, we're going to talk about how to consecrate the priests. And then in 30, we're going to go back into the holy place and we're going to talk about the altar of incense. Specifically. Uh, specifically. <clears throat> the shekel, which is the uh, like a temple tax to support the priesthood. We're going to go back out in the courtyard, talk about that big wash basin, the lava of brass. We're going to talk about some spices. Chapter 31, we're going to introduce Bezalel, who is the craftsman who is anointed by God to build all this stuff. And God's going to remind us at the end, hey, and you're not allowed to do any of the work on the Sabbath. So that's kind of an overview of where we are and what we're going to do. So, good job. Yeah, I thought so. So we're going to be at 25, and we're going to have uh, <coughs> Nat go ahead and read uh, just the first paragraph, 1 through 9. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they bring me an offering. Of every man that giveth it willingly with his heart, ye shall take my offering. And this is the offering which ye shall take of them, gold and silver and brass and blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen and goat's hair and ram skins dyed red and badger skins and shittim wood, oil for the light, spices for anointing oil and for sweet incense, onyx stones and stones to be set in the ephod and in the breastplate, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them, according to all that I show thee after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall ye make it. So we've got to gather stuff from the people to make this. Yeah, you've got to have the ingredients. Got to make this. All right. Here's an actual live shot. Uh, of course, we have, there's a lot of large size models over in Israel. And this is what the temple looks like. Uh, kind tabernacle. of, or the tabernacle, not the temple, but the tabernacle. And you can see how it's got coverings and it's got pillars and there's a wash basin. And over here is the, the altar and around it is going to be this, this curtain with the pillars. <clears throat> okay. So we're in here today. We're going to be building a few of the things. Okay. Um, oh, here's one I didn't show you. That's a good one. Okay. <clears throat> so the tabernacle, the tent is divided up into the Holy of Holies and the holy place and the outer court out here. It's very, 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 very reminiscent of people. Yes. This is our outer body. Yep. This would represent our soul. Yep. And this would represent our spirit that's in touch with God. All under the same tent. So sometimes we can't tell our soul from our spirit because it looks the same. Yeah. And uh, that one. All right. Um, so let's look at uh, verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel that they bring me an offering um, of every man that giveth it willingly yeah. with his heart ye shall take my offering. And the word willingly, giveth willingly, is Nadab. Which is funny. Which, if you'll remember... From last time, the four folks that went up to on the mountain with Moses were Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu. No. And, uh, and, of course, Joshua was there, too. Nadab's mean, name means generous or giving willingly. Okay. Why don't you grab 2 Corinthians 9, 7, which is, of course, an excellent verse for that. I was wondering if we were going to go there. Yeah, absolutely. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 has much to say about um, giving. This is the Lord's offering. He says specifically, my offering. And uh, sometimes I think whenever we give at church, we often forget. We think, oh, we're just putting in the offering. you know. But it is technically an offering unto the Lord, and, and he's watching to see if we're giving it willingly and, and what our, our heart attitude is. Yep. So um, 2 Corinthians 9, 6, and 7. But this I say... He which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man, according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, 
not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. The, um, the actual taking up of this offering uh, is in Exodus 35, and I want to read this before we get into all of yes. the stuff that we're taking up. All right, so Moses is going to spend a long time, several chapters, up on the mountain, and when he finally comes down in, uh, I think it's the end of chapter 31, and then he's got to tell everybody, hey, we're going to do this, and there's, there's a few things with a, a golden calf and, a, you know, bunny trails. Mm -hmm. But by the time he actually takes up the offering, it's in Exodus 35, uh, verse 21. Let me look at 20. It says, And all the congregation of the children of Israel departed from the presence of Moses, and they came, every one whose heart stirred him up, yeah. and every one in everyone whom his spirit made willing. And they brought the Lord's offering to the work of the tabernacle of the congregation and for all the servant service and for the holy garments. And they came, both men and women. I love that. Mm -hmm. You know, going back and thinking about the, the times and how women, you know, were put down in, in other countries. And the Lord's like, no, just have everybody bring it. The men were bringing, the women were given. Yeah. It says, as many as were willing hearted, that was the one requirement, and brought bracelets and earrings and rings and tablets, uh, all jewels of gold. And every man that offered, offered an offering of gold unto the Lord. And every man with whom was found blue and purple and scarlet, uh, that's a... Uh, uh, they're like fabrics, yeah. okay? Fabrics usually made out of wool that were that color. So blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen and goat's hair and red skins of rams and badger skins brought them. Every one that did offering, offer an offering of silver and brass brought the Lord's offering and every man with whom was found shittim wood for any work of the service brought it. And all the women that were wise-hearted did spin with their hands. Now, so they brought in, like, um, what they're doing is they're bringing in full-blown blankets, if they got them. They're bringing in pillowcases. They're bringing in sheets. They're bringing in robes, just yeah. whatever they might have. Yeah. But then, the, you know, whenever they left Egypt, they brought their flocks with them. And so it says, and the women that were wise-hearted did spin with their hands. So they're, they're actually shearing making the sheep, it. and they're making thread. And it says, and they brought that which they had spun, both of blue and of purple and of scarlet and of fine linen, and all the women whose hearts stirred them up in wisdom spun goat's hair. And the rulers brought onyx stones and stones to be set for the ephod and for the breastplate, and spice and oil for the light and for the anointing oil and for the sweet incense. The children of Israel brought a willing offering unto the Lord, every man and woman whose heart made them willing to bring for all manner of work which the Lord had commanded to be made by the hand of Moses. Amen. It just says willing, <clears throat> willing, 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 willing. I think they were eager. Yeah. You know, this this is the God. I, you know, they they we talk about the times that they rebelled, but in between that, they had a willing heart. Yeah. I mean, they they have the God of all gods on their yeah. side, and he, they just got rescued from Egypt, and they're very grateful. Uh, they gave so much that it says in 36.5, And they spake unto Moses, mm -hmm. saying, The people bring much more than enough for the service of the work which the Lord commanded to make. And Moses gave commandment, and they caused it to be proclaimed throughout the camp, saying, Let neither man nor woman make any more work <clears throat> for the offering of the sanctuary. And yeah. he had to actually restrain them from giving, right. which is fantastic. So we're... So where are all this stuff coming from? Before we get into all the details, right? Um, first off, you got to realize that whenever they went down into Egypt, these are the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Uh, there were they were wealthy. Yeah, they had inheritance from their forefathers. Abraham was wealthy, and he grew it. Isaac was wealthy, and he grew it. And Jacob was wealthy, and mm -hmm. he grew it. And, and then when, they went into bondage. And, and even whenever they went down into Egypt, they didn't go in. They weren't like taken captives no. and have their stuff still. No. They had gone down there. They grew and, and and as among the people as traders. Yeah. And so all that time they're gathering wealth. So uh, don't get the idea, oh, my goodness, the poor Israelites, they lived in the land of Goshen, but they were in huts. It wasn't like that. Right. 
It wasn't like that. So they had their forefathers, uh, but also whenever they left Egypt, they spoiled the Egyptians, and yeah. all the women gave them their nose jewels and things like that from Exodus 12. And I forgot this one. Um, in Exodus 17, the Amalekites oh, yeah. attacked them, and Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword, and the Lord gave them the victory. So there may have been some spoils of war oh, mixed yeah. in there as well. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Um, this is going to go it just into detail on the materials. All okay. Right? Um, so he says, And this is the offering which ye shall take of them, gold and silver and brass. First thing, notice, there's no iron. It's just... No, it's the good stuff. It's just the good stuff. Yeah. It's the good stuff. God's going God's gonna to use that gold to cover the arcs with. He's going to use the silver um, to make... Uh, pieces of the pillars and and he's going to use the brass for things that have to be hard because brass is really hard um, so a couple things gold there are in Hebrew six words for gold what yeah I wonder what you were doing here Zahab which refers to the fact that it's yellow uh, Sigor I guess which means fine gold okay uh, Paz which is a native or pure gold uh, Betzer, which just is referring to the ore, and it could be gold or silver. Yeah. Uh, Ketham, which is whenever we see the golden wedge, we know who did the uh, AI. Uh, and then Harut uh, is, just means dug out, and it's more of a poetic kind of a thing that's used. Uh, for the most part, the word that's most commonly used in the Old Testament is Zahab, and that's what's used here, and it's referring to the fact that it's a yellow metal. Um, Gold is the most valuable metal uh, of the day back then, yeah. and it's had a typology, a symbolism of God. So, so whenever you read the Bible and you come across the word gold, you're going to think, oh, something about God yeah. must be going yeah. on here. That's why they use it for their idols. You know, yeah. it's just it was the most, you know, it's malleable. You can do stuff. You can overlay stuff with it. It doesn't rust. You know, it's. It's rare, mm -hmm. which, you know, drives the value up. There's a lot of good reasons to have gold. Yeah, but they didn't have gold coins back then. Mostly, I th whenever I was doing my research, most of the time at this point, sometimes people would have a gold nugget. Yeah. Or they would have uh, uh, like a purse. Remember how they had a blanket yeah. and they would have their silver pieces? Yeah. They might actually have gold dust in there sure. that's wrapped up with their silver pieces in their little purse. Uh, or of course, Earrings. more yeah, more commonly you had gold jewelry because yeah. once you got enough dust or enough ore, they would go ahead and turn it into something that they could wear Big because it's chains. easier to carry. Uh, probably not thick chains, but <laughs> little chains. No. And uh, silver, we've talked about many times, uh, is kasef, which is the word for money. And as you read through your Bible. When you see silver, it's almost always associated with the price of redemption. Yes. So when Jesus was yes. sold, he was sold for 30 pieces of silver. Yes. Um, the word for brass, uh, nekoseph, uh, br brass is, is brass, but the, the word, um, I'm sorry, the, the typology of brass is that it's normally judgment because they'll say like it burned like brass in a fire of right. furnace and all this stuff. And, and as you read through your Old Testament, uh, if you read the word brass, uh, a lot of times the idea of judgment is thrown in there. And we'll see that as we take these materials and start building the different pieces. Um, now, I do want to comment on the word brass. Okay. Um, brass is a copper alloy. Yes. It comes when you mix copper and zinc. There is another copper alloy called bronze. And we talk about the Bronze Age or whatever. But the bronze is a mixture of copper and tin. Copper and tin, bronze, has been around forever. Okay? That is the word nekoseth. So I was doing some research on that because I'm like, well, my Bible says brass. It's brass. I don't know why I never thought of this before. I can't take language from 2021 and put it on a 1611 Bible. 
back in 1611, if I said the word brass, I would be referring to what we call bronze today. So what what will happen is uh, a Bible denier will say, well, they didn't even have brass back then. Brass, you know, brass didn't even uh, exist. Uh, br- yeah, the, the brass was discovered about 500 BC um, on the. Um, uh, it was an island in the in the Mediterranean. What's the one where the Crete, Sicily, Cyprus, uh, the uh, the big the big Gibraltar, Malta. Yeah, one of those. Um, but anyway, what happened was they had dug up copper and it had been mixed with some zinc. Yeah. Because it, they grow sometimes together. Zinc's a little bit of a white powder. You don't need much to turn the copper when it melts. You don't need much to turn it really, really hard You know, into this really hard brass. Yeah. Okay. Tin, tin is much more easier to work with. You mix it with copper. You get bronze. Bronze is a lot easier to work with. Uh, and so anyway, so whenever you read the word brass in your 1611 Bible, put yourself back 400 years and realize that they were using the word bronze. So is the one that's in the Bible the copper and the tin or the copper? The copper and the tin. Okay. Yeah, it's not the super hard stuff, which is what I always thought because my Bible says brass. Yeah. Well, your Bible says brass because in 1611 that referred to bronze. Oh, boy. Uh, yeah, the uh, the word that we use for bronze didn't come to mean bronze until almost the 1800s. Wow. So, so anyway, so that's what, what that is. Um, let's go on. Verse 4. And blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen and goat's hair. And goat's hair. And goat's hair. So blue... And uh, blue and purple and scarlet fabrics, linens. are fabrics, mm-hmm. and you can make fabrics out of many different things. The, all the experts agree it's wool. Okay. okay? Remember how we read that um, uh, the hyssop was, was wrapped with scarlet, yes. scarlet wool. And so they're like, yeah, this, this is scarlet and blue and purple wool. It's sheep's, sheep's, blue. sheep's fur, right? And... This it's stuff, a special blue. It's not like from blue flowers, right? It's a uh, it's a bluish purple. Okay, these are seashells, mussels. All right. I'm glad our color was adjusted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> some are bluish, some are purplish. Okay, and they grow. The these these mussels are all over the shallow areas of the Mediterranean. And do you know they still have the giant piles of those things? where these people would gather them. When I realized that, I went, wait a minute. This took an awful long time to build this tent oh, yeah. because they had to shear the sheep. Yeah. They, had to, they had to spin the thread. They actually, the Bible actually talks about they employed the weavers. Yeah. So they had to weave it into to make oh, yeah. sheets out of it. Yeah. You so had to now, train everybody. So now you've got, now you've got sheep's wool yeah. blankets. And now you're dyeing it. Well, meanwhile, while the girls are doing this, the guys are off there. Um, what you do is you take a mussel that's about this big, you crack him open, probably eat him because, hey, you know, yeah. and the seafood's all right. And there's a little gland in there. And when they take the little gland out and they squeeze it, it's kind of a milky, snotty-looking substance. But when it comes into contact with air, it turns a color. And one, one kind turns blue, and one kind turns purple. Huh. So uh, the uh, the blue was a, a blue. Now, when you think blue, think blue with just a tinge of purple in it. So more like a, it's blue, but it's leaning toward violet. So it's blue, but it's it's got a leaning toward a little bit of purple, but not, not very purple. Just it's the color of a deep sky. Okay. Okay. And that's what the typology is. And so as you're seeing blue in the Bible, think sky. Think sky. Think okay. heaven. Think heaven. That's right. Think purity. Think those things. Purple, on the other hand, came from a different shellfish. And I love this. The purple is actually a reddish purple. Okay. And purple is the color of kings and royalty and yeah. things like that. Uh, we find in the book of Acts 
chapter uh, 16, verse 14, Lydia was a seller of purple. Yeah. And so she was selling the purple fabrics in the New yeah. Testament. Yep. One telling about the crucifixion, they put scarlet on Jesus, and another one says they put purple on him, and they're mm -hmm. both right. And they're both right because it's a reddish pur purple. Um, the, uh, the, the Greek word is for this kind of purple, the Hebrew is argamon, but the, the Greek is porphyropolis or porphyra, which we get the word purple from. Okay. So our word purple actually comes from the Greek word for purple. Uh, anyway, it's just it's goofy. I love it. Yeah. So anyway, so that's what that is. Um, scarlet, if you haven't, oh my heavens. Scarlet, of course, is the little worm that uh, climbs up on the tree and lays its eggs underneath of itself, uh, under its body, and it protects its children, and these eggs, and it dies there and leaves a tiny blood streak on the wood. And <laughs> you remember that? Yeah. Uh, whenever Jesus says in Psalm 22, he says, I am a worm and no man. It's the Tola worm. And it is this worm. And they go around and, again, think of the work that's involved in this. They have to go through and they have to gather up you know, th think thousands. of thousands of these little dry, dead worm body things that have that have latched onto the wood and they grind them up and they're scarlet red, scarlet red. And then and then you would dye the fabric with this, <laughs> uh, which is so much work, man. It's so much. Work. I, I blew my mind. This tabernacle is just like all about working for it. Um, it was also about like if you think of it, it's kind of like the individual contribution. Yes. You know, yes. one little worm doesn't make a whole lot, but you put a whole bunch of little worms together and you have a tabernacle. And, and, and this scarlet is like a, you know, we've seen silver, which is type of redemption. Yeah. This scarlet is type of redemption because it refers back to Jesus. Uh, the fine linen, of course, is the white linen, which, which we've looked at before, the bisis, which was from... So amazing. There's two kinds of linen. There's the linen that grows from the reeds in Egypt, and then there's the linen that's uh, again that one of those little mussels, a mollusk, and, yeah, a like mollusk. A clam. And and what he does is instead of laying there, he he puts himself vertically and he sends out threads to hold himself and to anchor himself. And these people ask themselves, I wonder if we can weave that. And they did. And they did. And it's a super fine, super expensive linen. Uh, Bysus. It's B-Y-S-S-U-S. -S -S, wonderful Bible study we've already done on that. Uh, but again, from the mussels, from, yeah. from, the, from the sea. But again, many, 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 many mussels. Had to be gathered. Because you're making huge, thick. Yes, yeah. And they probably, because of that curtains, because of how rare this stuff is, it might have oh been my. the fine linen from Egypt or, oh or whatever. It doesn't matter. It's just an awful lot of work. And it's a lot of like little things, like you're saying, like muscles are this big, and I'm making a courtyard, and I've got it. Yeah, it's crazy. It's a lot of work. All right, goat's hair. We all know what goat's hair is, and they would spin it. It's a very tough fabric, and even now the Bedouins use it in tents, ropes, food sacks, and saddlebags. It handles a lot of moving and 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 stuff, so it's going to be perfect to durable. make the yeah, durable. That's where it, it's going to be perfect to make the outer covering of the this tent thing because the inner the inner pieces are going to be fine linens uh, like sheets bed sheets and it's not going to be very weather resistant but then on top of that you're going to have goat's hair and then on top of that you're going to have badger skins now we've already talked about goat's hair goat's hair is amazing because when it gets well wet the individual fibers will swell and it's waterproof but when it's dry the ha individual hairs shrink and it actually allows uh, air to move through the tent to keep it cooler. It's not as stagnant inside. Hmm. Um, ram skins dyed red. What are we thinking? I'm thinking Jesus. I'm thinking Jesus. <laughs> this go think back to whenever Abraham <laughs> was told to take thy son Isaac, thine only son, and offer him. Yeah. And then God angels will provide himself. Uh, and he looks over and there's a ram caught by his horns in the thicket and it was a type of Jesus. But not just ramskin. 
dyed red. Got to dye it red because again we're seeing the picture of redemption in this tabernacle. The blood stain. Now we're going to stop here for uh, two seconds at <clears throat> verse five. It says uh, ram skins dyed red and badger skins. Badger skins. Okay. Commentators of the 1800s, which is where a lot of the commentators wrote, yes. uh, they basically said they're, they're, you, you, it's not badgers. There are no badgers over there. So they called them a thing called a rock hyrax, uh, which, which is not, by the way, because it, it's a badger. Um, <laughs> one, one guy called it a dugong. Oh, Do you know what a dugong is? It's like a manatee. It's a sea cow. Uh, it's been called dolphin skins, antelope skins, Maybe an extinct animal. How about seals? Matter of fact, the ESV says it's goat skins. The NIV, the older version, said sea cows. Uh, the ISV called it dolphin skins. The ASV called it seal skins. The NASB calls it porpoise skins. Holman Standard calls it manatee skins. The Catholic Dewey Rings Bible just says, no, it's something that's violet colored. We're not really sure. So, I'm going to just, because we're here, I want to show you why it can't be dolphins. No, I'm not even going to go there. Let's, let's just do this. This is the best. This is the best. This, my friends, is the honey badger. Yes, he is. He's amazing. The honey badger yes. is the absolute toughest little animal on the face of the planet. He's fierce. They're fierce. They're, they, they're, they, they, will, they will back off a grizzly bear. Yes, they will take on a lioness. They don't. They don't have a, a drop of cowardice in them. They are one hundred percent courage. Yes, absolute courage, and they have almost no weak spots. Yeah. Okay. So God says, the honey badger. We've got them in North America, but they also have them all across Europe. Uh, they can go all the way through the Middle East. They they're, they're in Palestine right now. There's badgers. Maybe not the honey badger. But a type of badger. Yeah. They go up through the Soviet Union, and they're actually through Africa. They're all through there. Well, nobody can get rid of them. You can't get rid of them. <laughs> so, they're fierce. So God says, I want that. <laughs> go get me a bunch of those. I want a bunch of those. Now, one of the commentators said, well, it couldn't possibly couldn't possibly be badgers because badgers are so small you'd have to you'd have to skin a, a, a thousands of them in order to make the tent and I'm thinking to myself did you not read the part about, about the, 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 the the red worms the red worms and the muscles <laughs> yeah did, did you not read that part yeah. and uh, so so it's funny because the the badger you know but you, we're trying to keep two million people occupied so here we go. Yeah, that's true. They didn't have TV back then. <laughs> so here's a half a million young boys. Yeah. Go. go. Idle hands are the devil's workshop. Go get, you guys go pick worms. Yeah, you guys. Off the trees. You guys go get some badgers. So anyway, so what yeah. they did is they had to go get they had to go get badgers. They had to find them. Oh my word. Yeah. Well, they they live in the desert out there too. I, I so there's badgers. So they had to get them and they had to kill them and they had to. Badger skins are uniquely. They're uh, apparently amazing. Hmm. Everything rolls off of them. Water, snow, ice, it doesn't matter. If you want a good coat that will protect you from anything, a badger skin coat will. But you'll lose your arm doing it. But you'll lose your arm doing it. <laughs> now, I, now, this is going to be the outside yes, the visible, covering. The visible part. So whenever a stranger walks up, he doesn't see all the reds and the blues and all the pretty linens. What he sees is, huh, you got black goat skin covered by badger skin. And we are going to look for one second at Ezekiel. Yes, Ezekiel chapter 16. Because this is one of my favorite things in, that I've ever seen in the Bible. Oh, but this is the one that makes me think of. And um, he hath no form nor comeliness, and when we see him, there's no beauty that we should desire him. Yeah, <laughs> Jesus was not an, uh, he's not attractive on the outside. Yeah, he doesn't look like those paintings. Yeah, he was, he was beautiful on the inside. Yeah, he was and, a man. And the tabernacle was, was symbolic of him. Um, but Ezekiel 16, I don't know if you know this or not. Nope. Ezekiel 16 Every verse in the Bible that mentions badger skins always talks about the covering for the tabernacle, the covering for the tabernacle, the covering for the tabernacle, until you get to Ezekiel 16, verse 
8, 9, and 10. It says, Now when, when I passed by thee, this is the Lord, whenever the Lord found Israel. He says, And I looked upon thee, and behold, thy time was the time of love. And I spread my skirt over thee, and covered thy nakedness. Yea, I swear unto thee, and entered into a covenant with thee, saith the Lord God, and thou becamest mine. This is the marriage of God in, in Israel. Then I washed thee with water. Yea, I thoroughly washed away thy blood from thee, and I anointed thee with oil. I clothed thee also with broidered work, and shod thee with badger's skin, and I girded thee about with fine linen, and I covered thee with silk. The only other time in the Bible that God mentions badger skin is when he's talking about, I'm going to make the shoes for my bride out of the absolute <laughs> toughest, most courageous, a little bit of an animal hey. that has no fear. No fear, all boldness. And he writes in the, in the Song of Solomon, and he says, How beautiful are thy feet with shoes, O prince's daughter. Shod the, with the preparation, the gospel of peace. That's right. God wants us to have no fear Ooh. when whenever we <laughs> go out and preach the gospel. He wants our feet shod with badger skin. Isn't that good preaching? That's good. That's good preaching. That's good. Whew. All right, we're only on. Makes me want to go get some badger moccasins. I know, doesn't it? Oh. Oof. You know who used them? Roman soldiers. Oh. Yeah. Well, that's smart. Yeah. Badger skin. Yeah. Shoes. Um, and shittim wood. Now, shittim wood is acacia wood. It's really the only tree that grows out there that's worth anything. Uh, here you can see some growing in the back, and there's this guy here. But it has a decent length to it. They're not too crooked. Um, and acacia wood, if you, like I sell tables and furniture for a living, acacia wood is hard as oak. Uh, so this is a very solid wood. It's a pretty large hardwood. Um, the, uh, the bark is used to treat infections. Yeah. And, uh, and the, there was an ointment used uh, for treating leprosy. Oh. <laughs> from, from acacia wood. That's good too. And leprosy, of course, is sin in the Bible, yeah. and so shittim wood, this acacia wood that we're going to build the whole thing out of, the yeah. bark was used for treating leprosy. Yeah. You just, I mean, the Bible is so neat. That's rich. Um, it was, uh, one guy said, it was used to make two things that we know of. It was used to make the Ark of the Covenant and mm. coffins in, the, in Egypt. Oh, boy. It was used for making coffins. That's <laughs> just, that just can't. It's Boxes. Crazy. It's used for making boxes. Now, in the temple, the temple doesn't use uh, shittim wood. So right now we're building a, the tabernacle, which is a tent, and it's temporary. But once we get up into King David and King Solomon, Solomon decides to build the temple, and he actually uses cedar and fir. Uh, and stone. And stone. So he's going to build something else. But right now we're dealing with what we got. They're roaming around the desert, and they've got shittim wood. Hmm. Uh, verse 6. Oil for the light. Yes. Um, oil is going to be olive oil. We're going to learn that later on. Yep. It's not specified here. And then it says spices for anointing oil because whenever they would anoint the high priests, yep. they would have to have frankincense and myrrh and all kinds of different the spices. Oil of the apothecary. Correct. Yes. And for sweet incense. Sweet incense. So the, the word for spices... Uh, for the anointing, the oil, the word for spices is actually besom, and we get the word balsam from it, and mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's a sweet spice, but then there is something else called sweet incense, and who knows what it was. Okay. Right. Verse 7, onyx stones, which are... Very black. A, a black stone. Sometimes they have white streaks in them, mm -hmm. and we're not going to get into it, but it's but think of it as an expensive stone. Mm -hmm. And when he says, and stones to be set in the ephod yeah. and in the breastplate, that word stones, um, it's, it's just the word for stones. It's just eben, E-B-E-N. But it's referring to gemstones. Like we would say that's an, a pretty stone you've got, and it's a diamond. Yeah, so you have semi-precious with onyx, and you have precious. Yeah, so we're going to have rubies and sapphires and all kinds of fun things that these yes. guys have brought with them out of Egypt. And now he says with for the ephod, 
Okay, this is a good picture. Uh, yeah, this is the high priest. He's actually very decked out. He's got little little bells down here along the hem of his garment. Uh, he's got blue uh, for his whatever this garment from seashells. is. seashells. Blue from seashells. Mm -hmm. He's got white linen, which is the righteousness of saints. Uh, he's got a, 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 a fancy um, uh, hat on, a mitre, a mitre, and it's going to say holiness to the Lord up here on a, on a little plaque. I think that is his little plaque. Oh, that is it right there. Yeah, holiness to the Lord on his forehead. Mm -hmm. uh, he's got this thing here, the breastplate with, with the gemstone set in it. Twelve of them. Uh-huh, and, and just a whole bunch of different things. Now, this particular thing that looks like a cooking apron, like I would put this on, it doesn't wrap around the back. It's It literally ends right here. Uh, so if he turned around, you wouldn't see it as much. It looks it looks like an apron that's been wrapped around the waist twice and tied in the front. And, uh, and if it had a little bit of lace, he could be making food for us. Cookies. Okay, that's the ephod. Okay, is is this this garment here? And then he talks about the breastplate. Now, an interesting thing about the word ephod. Uh, this is the the modern Hebrew word for ephod. Uh, going back into the early pictograph Hebrew, it looked like this. But let's look at the root. It's it's whatever this letter is and this letter, which is a door and a mouth that's open. So the root of ephod is PD, and it's a door that's open, and it means as in setting something at liberty, and this is the word for redeem. Mm. So he is literally wearing an ephod, which means that he is dressed in redemption. In redemption. Wow. Never heard that before, but glory to God, hallelujah. Wow. So that's what I'm saying. We've got the silver of redemption. <laughs> we've got... We've and got, Jesus is our high priest. We've, and Jesus is our high priest. And he's and dressed he's in redemption. clothed in redemption. Yeah. And so you've got you've got the, the red blood insects, which is redemption. You've got the blue, ram sky, ram's dye red, that's redemption. You've got the blue royalty. Yeah, it's, or the purple royalty. Purple royalty. Yeah, all sorts the of it going blue on. purity. This is just, it's full of symbolism, which is why Exodus and Leviticus, yeah. if you read it at the surface, it can just bore you to death. But if, oh, but if you get a hold of the symbolism in here, we haven't even gotten through the, you know, the... the Six verses. Yeah, we have, I mean, hello. What can, <laughs> what can you do? It's absolutely amazing. It's literally absolutely amazing. Um, I'm not going to go into there. All right. Um, let's, let me look at... Um, Verse 8, he, he says, And let them make me a sanctuary, a holy place, that I may dwell among them. Revelation 7.15, because I know you love to go there. I do. I think that, um, the, to me, the most important part there is that God is the one who first states his desire to live with us. And we love him because he first loved us, and then we state our desire to live with him. Ah, that's cool. Yeah. Yes. Revelation 7, 15. 15. Turning the page. Therefore, therefore are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. It's, it's the theme from the beginning of the Bible to the end. God wants a people and he wants to be able to live among them. Yeah. But he is so holy that for us to be in his presence destroys us. We're just burned up like leaves in a fire. Which is why we have to have the outer fencing <laughs> of white purity. Yeah. Yeah. That's, because we cannot approach. We just can't. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's to keep out the ordinary people. So they only don't the, die. Only the priest can get into this courtyard here. And then only the high priest can go into that part of at the back the farthest part anyways but normal people yeah i mean he says now according to all that i show thee this is how you're going to make it he does not say to moses according to all that i tell thee he says according to all that i show thee after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof even so shall you make it 
one of the reasons that Moses was up on the mountain for 40 days and for 40 nights was because God was not just going to dictate him some plans. He was going to walk him through the heavenly tabernacle, and he was going to say, now look at this and see how this works. I want you to make one of these. Crazy. Where'd you, where'd you go to? Hebrews 8. Oh, yeah, might as well go. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Read that one. Um, this is Hebrews 8. Now, of the sum of the sum of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. I'm sorry. I said that twice. Now, of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man, for every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices, wherefore it is, necess it is of necessity that this man have somewhat also to offer. For if he were on earth, he should not be a, a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law, who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admi admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle, for see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. So what we've got here is he showed it to him. There's a heavenly tabernacle. What we've got here is that when Moses goes up, God you shows... You could have just showed the picture. God shows him, hey, here's what it's supposed to look like. Mm -hmm. And then he comes down and he builds it. Now this to me is one of the most incredible things. Since we're in, in Hebrews for a second... In chapter 9, verse 11, just skipping down through some of it, it says, But Christ, being come a high priest of good things to come by greater and more perfect tabernacle, verse 11, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building. So he says, Jesus is the high priest of the tabernacle in heaven, not the one down here that's made by hands, not the one of our building, but the one that God made up here in heaven. Yeah. And then he says in verse 24, so the high priest, Jesus, went after Jesus died and, and, and shed his blood, he went up to heaven. He went in through the gate of the heavenly tabernacle and he walked past everything and he offered his own blood on the mercy seat in heaven. Of the real tabernacle. Which is amazing. Verse 24 of Hebrews 9. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, no, 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 which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor yet that he should offer himself often, as the high priest entered into the holy place every year with the blood of others, for then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world, hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. And unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Chapter 10. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things. The godly thing is the very image. He says, those things cannot never with those sacrifices, these earthly sacrifices, which they offered year by year continually, make the comers thereunto perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered? And he goes on and he talks about how Jesus offered his own blood, the perfect blood in the perfect tabernacle on the perfect mercy seat. Once for all. One time for everybody, forever, sat down at the right hand of God and said, it's done. <laughs> <laughs> that's the pattern that's that's in heaven and of course <laughs> poor Moses is like you want me to build one of these <laughs> you know what I thought was funny too you know we we were laughing earlier when we were going through Genesis anytime you want to find out uh, anything about the Old Testament you should always go to Stephen right before he was stoned because he'll fix your doctrine he'll fix your doctrine well, Acts 7, 44, he um, said, Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness, as he had appointed, speaking unto Moses, that he should make it according to the fashion that he had seen. What verse is that? That's in Acts 7, 44. Okay. And it's called the tabernacle of witness. Otherwise, in the Old Testament, it's called the tabernacle of testimony. Yes. Tabernacle of the custom. Uh, and was it neat? 
I know we, we're, we're just we're really bogged on but it's just the tabernacle is so amazing this is just maybe this is just an introductory week but yeah look at Isaiah 6 verse 6 if you can get it in your head that there is a temple a real temple in heaven that Moses was going up to look at and saw and he saw look at Isaiah yes look at Isaiah 6 we'll just start at chapter yes. Isaiah 6 verse 1. In the year that, this is Isaiah talking, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. <clears throat> above it stood the seraphims, that is above the throne. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. That is two here, two there, two the other. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Amen. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. This is the heavenly house that Moses was saw. He saw. And he says, Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. We're going to read about that in this chapter. He's going to instruct Moses on how to build the tongs and how to build the, the altar comes in a couple of chapters. It just blows me away. Yeah. The book of Revelation in... I'm sorry. I, <laughs> just keep holding this up. The book of Revelation in 15.5. There's one of those. It, listen to this. He says, and after that, this is John talking, and after that I looked and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. And seven angels came out of the temple having the seven plague, plagues clothed in pure and white linen. These are the heavenly priests, these angels. They come walking out of the heavenly temple to disperse their plagues over the tribulation of, uh, uh, over the earth. <laughs> it's amazing. It really opens up the rest of the Bible to you if you'll keep in mind that Moses is looking at the actual real heavenly tabernacle temple thing. Isn't that amazing? That's a blessing. All right, hey, now, why don't you read uh, uh, 10... To, um, hmm. 10 to 22. <clears throat> we, we, won't, we won't cover all of it, but we'll get through a couple of it. And they shall make an ark of shittim wood. Two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a ha half the breadth thereof, and a cubit and a half the height thereof. And thou shalt overlay it with pure gold, within and without shalt thou overlay it, and shalt make upon it a crown of gold round about. And thou shalt cast four rings of gold for it, and put them in the four corners thereof. And two rings shall be in the one side of it, and two rings in the other side of it. And thou shalt make staves of shittim wood, and overlay them with gold. And thou shalt put the staves into the rings by the sides of the ark, and the ark may, that the ark may be borne with them. The staves shall be in the rings of the ark, they shall not be taken from it. And thou shalt put into the ark the testimony which I shall give thee. And thou shalt make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof. And thou shalt make two cherubims of gold. Of beaten work shalt thou make them in the two ends of the mercy seat. And make one cherub on the one end, and the other cherub on the other end, even of the mercy seat shall you make the cherubims on the two ends thereof. And the cherubims shall stretch forth their wings on high, covering the mercy seat with their wings, and their faces shall look one to another. Toward the mercy seat shall the faces of the cherubims be. And thou shalt put the mercy seat above upon the ark, and in the ark thou shalt put the testimony that I shall give thee. And there will I meet with thee, and I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubims, which are upon the ark of the testimony of all things which I will give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. Yeah, that's so awesome. So the ark, the first thing that we've got to remember 
and I mentioned this earlier, is that God starts with the most important piece. Inside out. The very inside of the, of the, the Holy of Holies, and then he works his way out, gets to the priest, and then works his way back in. Yeah. And so this is... We're the, the same way. We always say body, soul, and spirit, but it's spirit, soul, and body, because mm -hmm. God looks at us from the inside out. And in Thessalonians, where he lists them, he says spirit, soul, and body. Not the other way around. Not the other way around. And he says, all right, so he says, and they they shall make, an, talk about the people, they shall make an ark. Just means box. It means all a right? box. It just means a box. It's going to be... It doesn't look like Noah's ark. It's just a box. It's going to be, it, but it, well, it kind of does. Well, all right. It's a box. It's a box. It's a shoe box, but it's big. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, the ark is called the Ark of the Covenant. Yep. It's also called the Ark of the Testimony because that's what's put inside. It's yeah. the Ten Commandments, these last few chapters that we read that they agreed to. That's what's inside. It's also called the Ark of the Lord or the Ark of the God of Israel. So far, we've seen three arcs. Noah's Ark? Mm -hmm. Which was an ark of gopher wood that was pitched within and without with pitch. What was the other one? Anybody? Wait a minute. We okay. saw another ark, another box. We saw an ark. Back in Exodus chapter 2. Oh, yeah, Moses' Moses's, Moses's ark. She took for him an ark of bulrushes and yep. daubed it with slime and with pitch. So, so first we had gopher wood. That How was, would you like to be sitting in the seat and have him just throw questions at you mid bit? So we got <laughs> gopher wood for Noah pitched within and without with pitch. And we mentioned that the word pitch was the word for atonement. And then we had the, the ark of bulrushes that Moses was put in that was also pitched within with slime and pitch. Now this one is special. This one is shittim wood, acacia wood, and it's pitched or overlaid within and without with gold. gold. It's amazing. So how big is this box? It's <clears throat> two and a half cubits long. All right, each cubit is about 18 inches, so you got three foot nine inches. That's two cubits. You got two cubits and a, and a half. And a half. So about here. About there. Yeah. So so that's about three foot nine inches long by two foot three by two foot three. It's not a very big box, okay? And what we're going to do... And then it's decorated. Is then we're going to decorate it. And I want, I'm going to point out a few things that are on here, okay? <clears throat> First off, you can clearly see that there's the crown, which is, you know, now this is just an artist rendition, but it was the best one that I found. Yeah. It's got the border. The Bible says there was a border of a hand breath. That's what this part is, okay? And then it's got the crown. It's got uh, this, uh, this cherubim and a cherubim, okay? This is not what they looked like, but this is a good representation. It has, it has a gold ring that's on the side, yep. and on the side, but also on all four corners. And then it has the stave. Now, what's wrong with the stave? It's not gold. It should be covered in gold. We already learned that. Okay, so this, this is not the real one. And we, it should never be removed. And I always think of like back, you know, like whenever God struck Uzziah, you know, because he steadied it and he died because somebody took the staves out. No, it was, and it was, it was they supposed were to be born on the shoulders. I know, but they, they, I think that if, if the staves had been left in it... He could have grabbed a stave to no, steady it. No, 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 no. Everybody would have looked at it and gone, oh, you got to carry that thing. Uh -huh. But instead, because it didn't have the staves in You're it, they right. threw it in an ox cart. They threw it in an ox cart, and the guy that lost his life because... someone pulled the staves up. Because he thought he was doing the right thing, yeah. but he wasn't doing what God wanted. Let's talk about <laughs> salvation for a moment, shall we? You can think you're doing salvation the right way, but if you're not doing it God's way, then you don't have salvation. So a lot of times people say, well, i got to work to get to heaven. Well, you know what? It's good to work, but that's not what God said. Yeah, it's you, good to do good things. The guy says, well, I think I'm going to follow one of these other gods. I'm going to follow Buddha, the teachings of, of Buddha. Well, that's really nice. I mean, Buddha taught uh, selflessness and, and loving others. I understand why you would mm -hmm. want to follow that, but that's not God's way. A good way doesn't make it God's way. A good way doesn't make it God's way. All right, so we, we talked about the size of this thing. Um, yeah, and it's gold. And it's gold. It's shittim wood. It's heavy. 
you know, it's like an oak table. It's an oak box covered with gold overlaid, which was, you know, it's relatively heavy, but they it would have been thin. Those rings would have been thick. Okay, I keep thinking about that. that part. Verse 11, <laughs> and thou shalt overlay it with pure gold within and without, shalt thou overlay it, and thou shalt make upon it a crown of gold round about. We already looked at that. Yeah. You got to think, when you open this thing inside, up and you look inside, you just see gold. You look on the outside, you just see gold. Everything about it is gold. Gold represents God. God. So it's this, divinity. This is a representation of the throne of God, and that's why the, the Ten Commandments are going to go in there, is because that's where they came from. They came out of God. So what else went in that? Aaron's rod that budded uh, and the pot of manna. And it's not because they don't go in the ark because they came from God. They go to God. They go in there for another reason. What was it? Okay. Oh, you you may do this. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, we're just having fun. All here. right. So, so it's eight o'clock. Th this is just personal. We still got two hours. This is personal belief. So, when you walk into the holy place, you had the bread mm -hmm. and the candlestick. No, the other way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You had yeah the bread and the candlestick and. The altar of incense. Okay, so you got the Word of God on the right hand side, and you got the Spirit, the of, God, Spirit of God on the left, and you got the service of God uh -huh. here in the middle. Yeah, and inside, inside the Ark of the Covenant, I have the pot mm -hmm. of manna, I have the rod and of Aaron that budded, and I have the Ten Commandments. Mm -hmm. So I have a type of the Word, the service, and the Spirit all all there under the Lordship. Under and see, this is the difference, okay? In your Christianity, you can know the Bible, but not be under the Lordship. You can serve God, but not be under the Lordship. You can have a spiritual walk, but not be under the Lordship. God doesn't want you to stay in the holy place. He wants you to move into the Holy of Holies, where everything that you do is inside the Ark of the Covenant, under the throne of God himself, so that my Bible, my spirit, and my service are all under him, and he's the Lord of all of it. It's not supposed to be just me reading my Bible. That's, it's, a, that's exactly right. Yeah. That's exactly what it is. And that's why it's in the ark. <laughs> and they also represent those three pieces. And we're just, we're just oh, yeah. spitballing right here. Represent the, all the pieces of the soul, the mind, yes. the will, and the emotions. All under the Lordship all of Christ. All under the Lordship of Christ. Matter of fact, the Bible talks about our life being hid with Christ in God. The ark represents God. You put the lid on it, and our life is hid with Christ in God. There are so many lessons, guys that are hidden in this tabernacle. the tabernacle you could i mean the whole bible <clears throat> paul got into it and he said oh i'm going to write books on this yeah and and he never he just didn't stop all right let's keep going verse 12 and thou shalt cast in other words they're going to melt and they're going to pour into a mold we're going to we're going to cast the golden rings we're going to cast four rings of gold for it and we're going to put them in the four corners thereof Two rings shall be in the one side. See? It's on the four corners, but two rings shall be on this side, two rings on the other side. And thou shalt make staves of shittim wood, nice strong wood for carrying it, and overlay them with gold. And thou shalt put the staves into the rings by the sides of the ark, that the ark may be borne with them. The staves shall be in the rings of the ark, they shall not be taken from it. That thing was mobile. It was supposed to be mobile all Excuse the me. time. How much? How, how much further do you think we're going? Uh, we've been going to 15 more minutes. I'm just worried about her. I know your kids. It's fine. All right, let's look at here. We'll just go fast. And thou shalt put into the ark the testimony which I shall give thee. That's he says verse, that again in the 20 in verse, in verse 16. And if you want to look at the uh, the part with the uh, the manna. Uh, anyway, that's I think it's back in uh, Exodus 16. Yeah, Exodus 16, verse 32. Yeah, they put up. They it says that they put up a pot of manna before the Lord. Uh huh. Yeah, and, and eventually it's it finds here. its way in here. It's that's exactly right. It goes <laughs> in there. Um, already did that. Um, let's go real fast. Thou shalt make two cherubims of gold. No, 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 no. Okay, I skipped an important part. Right. Verse 17. And thou shalt make a mercy seat. Now the word mercy seat is, this is just the lid. Thou shalt make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half 
the sorry. Sorry, it's the dog. <laughs> we actually have a puppy right over there. Go get mommy. Yeah, that was fun. You go. You keep going. All right. So he says, "Thou shalt ha make a mercy seat of pure gold." I want you to see a very important thing about the mercy seat. Two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof. A cubit and a half shall be the breadth thereof. What's the depth? There isn't any. This is God's mercy seat. And God's mercy just keeps on going. Do you understand? It, God, there are certain things in the Bible, when I, whenever we're looking at this, uh, the laver, I think, is another one, where he doesn't give a dimension. It's because he wants us to understand that it is infinite. And this is on the mercy seat. God does not have a depth to his mercy. He never has, he never bottoms out on his mercy. So, that's why there's no depth given. Okay, so they made it. They obviously, whenever they made it, they just picked a random depth. But God wants us to know that I'm not interested in the depth of the mercy. You got the length. You got the width. It fits on there as a lid. And don't give them the measure of this because that has to do with my mercy. And my mercy is infinite. And then look at verse 18. He says, And thou shalt make two cherubims of gold of beaten work so it's hammered all right so he's going to take this mercy seat and whenever they make it they're going to have a slab of gold but part of that slab comes up into an angel on this side an angel of that side so it's all the same piece and they're going to use a hammer and they're going to beat a seraphim out on this side and a seraphim out on this side crazy that's amazing and remember what we said in ezekiel with twain they covered their face, with twain they covered their feet, and with twain they did fly. Seraphims have six wings. Anybody see a problem? Yeah. Yeah, they only give them two wings and two wings. You know why? Because that would be weird looking. It would be weird looking. There's actually a representation, uh, and I didn't print it off, on the internet, of what the ark would look like with an angel that had, basically it looks like a butterfly. They have, they have, Going out, oh, yeah. going out, and then there's kind of going up, and then there's kind of going back. So it's a complete covering of the of the top of the ark, which I it was just like an arch of wings, and I was like, now that's cool. Mm -hmm. And uh, and and remember, he's making this after the pattern of what he's already seen on the mount, and we read in the book of. Uh, uh, of Isaiah, we read in Ezekiel about the seraphim. They have four faces, and they have six wings. Yeah. And so he's going to have these carved out on the mercy seat, and that mercy seat is where they put the blood, and that actually represents the throne of God. And God says, "I'm going to speak to you from between the seraphim above the mercy seat," which is amazing. All right, uh, let's look at. Um, Let's look at uh, verse 19. And make one cherubim on the one end, the other cherub. Cherub is singular. Cherubim is plural. It's not cherubims. It's cherubim. Anything that ends in I, M is plural in Hebrew. Uh, and the other cherub on the other end, even of the mercy seat shall ye make the cherubims. And there he made me a liar. So cherubims is like the plural version. Mm -hmm. You could just say cherubim or cherubims. Uh, yes. The I am is plural. They're both right. That's like when we call God Elohim, and we say that that's a plural word for God. Uh, and the cherubim shall stretch forth their wings on high, covering the mercy seat with their wings, and their faces shall look one to another. Toward the mercy seat shall the faces of the cherubims be, and thou shalt put the mercy seat above upon the ark. It's a lid. It's a lid. And in the ark thou shalt put the testimony that I shall give thee. And there I will meet with thee. And I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat. I want you guys to remember something. <laughs> it's not above the judgment seat. God never talks with his children from above a judgment seat. He always talks with us from above a mercy seat. Isn't that amazing? He has right to. There. He has to. He has to. Uh, he has to. He strike us all dead. From between the two cherubims, which are upon the ark of the testimony of all things which I will give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. 
You know, if those cherubims could talk, they'd say, holy, holy, holy. Yes, they would. We just read about that. <laughs> um, let's see. I already covered a lot of that. I covered a lot of that. Don't want to cover that. Already covered that. No depth given. Talked about the angels. Talked about the angels. Purpose. I want to... Let's go ahead. We'll finish up here. Let's read uh, in Exodus chapter 37. Moses is going to eventually come down from the mountain. Yes. And he's going to set the people to work. Yes. And when they do, we're going to read about it in chapter 37. And so let's do that. Let's read 1 through 9. Want to do it? <clears throat> yeah. And Bezalel, that's the craftsman. <clears throat> God put all the wisdom in him, and so he's going to be in charge of building everything. Made the Ark of Shittim wood. Two cubits and a half was the length of it, and a cubit and a half the breadth of it, and a cubit and a half the height of it. Check. And he overlaid it with pure gold within and without, and made a crown of gold to it round about. And he cast for it four rings of gold to Check. be set by the four corners of it, even two rings upon the one side of it, and two rings upon the other side of it. And he made staves of shittim wood and overlaid them with gold. He put the staves into the rings by the sides of the ark to bear the ark. And he made the mercy seat of pure gold. Two cubits and a half was the length thereof, and one cubit and a half the breadth thereof. Doesn't tell the depth. And he made two cherubims of gold beaten out of one piece made he them on the two ends of the mercy seat. One cherub on the end on this side and another cherub on the other end on that side. Out of the mercy seat made he the cherubims on the two ends thereof. And the cherubims spread out their wings on high and covered with their wings over the mercy seat with their faces one to another even to the mercy seat word were the faces of the cherubims. Ooh, that's a new word, seat word. Isn't that great? That caught me off guard. <laughs> that's awesome sauce. This stuff is so exciting. I wish we could just do like four hours because we're literally only on verse 22, but it's amazing. So it's weird because... <clears throat> we'll pull the ark back up. I always think of this as one piece of the furniture. But whenever he lists it, he makes a paragraph mark at verse 6. You've got the, uh, the ark, the box, and then you have the mercy seat that was put on top of the box. Mm -hmm. That's two pieces of furniture. Oh, yeah. Yeah. In a way. No, I agree with you. Yeah. Yeah, because it, it's completely, it's separate. Yeah. So, so the box has the hand breath border. The box has the crown. And the stains and, that, and all that. But no, what I'm saying is, is that the mercy seat, the lid, is in here. Yeah. It's this is the lid, and it fits down on top. Yeah. And so when they would take this off to put things inside, the crown would still be there as yes. a border going around. Mm -hmm. It's really really cool, really cool. Next week we're gonna pick up with the candlestick. Look how big that baby is. The candlestick is, is a lot bigger than what I thought it was, but it it's supposed to it's going to be solid gold. Solid gold. Solid gold. One piece. Uh, and it's out of a talent of gold, so it's supposed to weigh about ninety four pounds. So it's probably not that big. Yeah, it's probably not this big. No, because this would be a couple like, hundred pounds. Yeah, yeah three hundred, four hundred pounds. <laughs> so it's probably it could be thinner. You know, yeah. um, so so that brings up another thing. We don't have the ark. We don't have the candlestick. No, Indiana Jones doesn't either. Yeah, we nobody has seen it. All we have is the have is the references that are in here. Yeah. Well, we know everything was. We we know for sure that most of the pieces of furniture were carried into the Babylonian captivity. Yes. We we're not sure about the ark because it wasn't in that list. We just don't know. We just don't know. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Uh, this was super fun. We'll pick up at uh, verse twenty three. The table of Shittim wood next time. I'll just put a line right here, and uh, and we'll just go from there. And it's amazing because we're going to have more and more and more references to Jesus. Hello, I am the bread of life, and I'm sitting there on the table. Anybody? Can... It's just amazing. Yeah. It's just amazing. Uh, so stick with us. Come back next week, and uh, why don't you pray? Lord God, thank you for loving us. We thank you for. Um, the tabernacle. We thank you for the Word of God. We thank you, Lord, for Moses being faithful and. Lord, it's just, it's just neat to think of the one that's up there. I mean, there's a real one in heaven. This was, you know, the pattern shown him in the mount, and there, right. there's a real tabernacle. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. And um, can't wait to see it myself. 
Thank and you. please help your bride to walk like she's wearing badger shoes. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> See y'all on the next one. <laughs>